know. Whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, to assure the survival and the success of liberty. The 22 November Network, the voice of the grassroots JFK research community. This is the Lone Gummin Podcast with your host, your boy, Rob Clark. Oh yeah, what's up everybody, and welcome to the Lone Gummin Podcast, episode number 20. I can't believe it's 20 already, it's crazy. Seems like just yesterday we started doing this. Um, before I forget, let me get a couple things off my chest first and foremost. Please, go check out Black Op Radio, episode 689 with the Dallas Action's own Doug Campbell as a guest. Amazing. Amazing job. I know he's part of the network, but man, that was a great, great appearance. Chock full of goodies for you. And like I said, you can find Doug right here on the 22 November Network. And uh, man, great job, buddy. It was awesome. Killed it. Killed it. Now, let me also talk a little bit about a uh, conference that's coming up here at the end of September. If you are anywhere close to Alexandria, Virginia, or you can get there relatively easy, uh, you can come down by train, you know, if you're in the New York area, it's it's a really short ride, Uh, it's a hop, skip, and a jump away on a plane from anywhere from a couple states away. Uh, or hop on 95 you can get there if you're coming from the south or north too uh, we would like you to join us at this conference and it's in Alexandria Virginia and it is a 50th uh, year look back or a critical look at the Warren Commission report and it's being held at the Crown Plaza East Hotel like I said, on September 26th through the 28th. And some of the guests lined up are uh, Peter Janney, Phil Nelson, uh, Doug Horn, uh, people like that. And uh, if you'd like more information, visit changehist. Dot, or I'm sorry, changehistjfk.blogspot.com. That's C H A N G E H I S T jfk.blogspot.com for more details and and ticket information Uh, we're going to have a great time me and Doug are going to be on the ground all weekend at the conference and we cannot wait it's going to be my first JFK conference I'm not sure about Doug but uh, either way we are going to have a blast at this thing Hopefully we're going to be able to provide uh, some great great content for you throughout the weekend. Some live content, some video content, audio content. Uh, we're going to be tweeting live. It's going to be awesome. I mean, we're going to cover this thing like nobody's business. And thank you once again to Dr. David Denton uh, for allowing us to do this and bring his conference to the people. Uh, But we would really like to see you there and hang out with you and meet you and greet you and talk to you. Uh, But if you can't, if it's out of your reach, uh, you can tune in to the 22 November Network for wall to wall, from ceiling to floor coverage for this thing. Uh, Me and Doug are going to be doing our own things. We're going to be doing things together. Uh, Hopefully we'll have some interviews for you with some of the people there. And... uh, 
full boogie tilt analysis from us all weekend long. So it should be great. Hopefully we'll see you there. Um, like I said, to visit the website for more information, uh, you can go to 22 November Network. We got a post up about it uh, with a link directly to their site. If you forget what I just spelled out for you, uh, just go to the 22 November Network uh, site, which you can reach right through my info page right here on Spreaker. It's a click away. Uh, it's it's 22 November Network WordPress.com. It's real easy. And the Facebook page is one click away. It's right there on my Spreaker info. Um, so please check it out and uh, enjoy. Also, pleased to announce a new member to the 22 ne ne uh, November Network uh, family. And that is Popeye and his show Down the Rabbit Hole. Uh, found on Truth Frequency uh, Radio. And he has been kind and gracious enough to allow us to accept him into the 22 November Network family. And we are going to be hopefully collaborating with him in the near future. Uh, and uh, we spoke with him recently personally on the phone. And thank you again, Popeye, for all your help and encouragement and advice. And he really helped us a lot getting this thing up and going and and kudos to him for helping us out he didn't have to uh, you know it was real cool of him to extend a hand uh, from somebody who's been in the same spot where I now and he is blown up he's huge he's federal jack I mean he's worldwide it's it's not just about the JFK assassination although he is interested in that he has got his toes in all kinds of water throughout the world uh, you know even current events um, and, and conspiracies and, uh, you know, government corruption. But, uh, so if you'd like to check out his show, come to 22 November Network. We'll have all the links up for you to check it out on our About page. That's where we list uh, our uh, family members. And trust me, Popeye knows what he's talking about, and you will enjoy his show. He does a fine job on... Uh, he really is a, an entrepreneur and you know he, he has created something massive and awesome out of out of literally nothing and he's a cool dude to boot so please support him and everything he's doing over there at federaljack.com now today let's do a deep swan dive back into Orleans Parish for a moment um, I know we've covered a lot of it, but believe me, there's a lot more to cover. Um, now the last time we, we dipped our toes in here, it was concerning, uh, Lee Oswald's antics, you know, and his, and his, uh, passing out the flyers and his, uh, Appearances on the Latin Listening Post with Bill Stuckey and those guys and Ed Butler and Carlos Brignier and uh, what you know exactly what he was doing down there. So if you'd like to go back and listen to that one first, go ahead. Uh, but we're going to dive in today a little bit and go a little deeper and examine a couple more things in a little bit more detail as far as what he exactly was doing in New Orleans. Um, the documents have surfaced, of course, that the CIA had penetrated the Fair Play for Cuba Committee with its own agents, and that they were supplying the agency with photographs of documents and correspondence purloined secretly from FPCC files. And it's also certain that Army Intelligence had an operational interest in left-wing groups, including the FPCC. The Intelligence Committee discovered at least one case in which a government informant was fronting as a Castro supporter while remaining an approved source of Army Intelligence. Okay, now if, if you remember back to right after the assassination, they were looking for Oswald. Um, they had a very strange name for him. 
it was Lee Henry Oswald of 605 Elsbeth. Okay, which is not his name, and it's not uh, the address that he put on his job application for the Texas School Book Depository. That is a name and an address that the Army Intelligence Unit had on file. Okay, so they must have known exactly who they're dealing with here. Uh, and they must have had well we know they had sources close on the ground uh, like uh, James Powell who could have obtained this information through a phone call quickly um, or of course sources in the uh, Dallas Police Department could have could have contacted them um, the assassinations committee they had a revelation that the Department of Defense had a file on Oswald and Heidel and they destroyed it. The, Ar the Army claims this unique record was destroyed routinely in accordance with normal file management. Um, <laughs> of course it was. Now, as you're going to hear next week uh, from, from Doug's podcast, actually this Sunday, he's going to tell you a little bit about Harry Dean, who was a very uh, unique fellow. And who did some interesting things that kind of paralleled what Oswald was doing. Well, I'm going to tell you right now about another guy who kind of paralleled what Oswald was doing. And you may not have heard of him before. Um, his name is John Glenn. Now, four days before the assassination, John Glenn appeared before the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Okay. Uh, this was something, of course, that Bannister supported. His, his questioning revealed that he had joined the Fair Play for Cuba Committee in the fall of 1962, and that he had tried to visit Cuba, at first by traveling through Mexico, and that he eventually succeeded. Okay? Sound familiar yet? Uh, in the summer of 63, at the very time Oswald was becoming active in New Orleans, Glenn did reach Cuba. He outstayed his original visa and then tried to travel on to another citadel of the left, Algeria. Uh, you know, the parallels with the Oswald uh, case are numerous, okay? And just as Oswald's fare home from Russia had once been paid by the State Department, Glenn's was paid from Europe. And like Oswald, Glenn used the post office box as a mailing address and subscribed to the militant newspaper. Okay, sound familiar? Yes. Okay, and like Oswald, he had previously traveled to the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. Sounds even more familiar. Uh, in, the, in his case, it was supposedly as a guide for an American travel agency. Okay, that's the cover that he used. Now, oh, get this. Uh, Glenn abruptly interrupted his university career to join the U.S. Air Force, where he became an intelligence operative. He received a crypto clearance and studied Russian. Alright, let's pause here for a second. This is precisely the kind of clearance that Oswald would have had as a radar operator. Um, this crypto clearance. Okay. His career as a left-wing activist began soon after he left Air Force Intelligence. The result of his trip to Cuba was uh, played out in front of the Un-American Activities Committee. Okay. As soon as Oswald had been revealed as a former defector to Russia, Carlos Brignier issued a shrill call for a congressional inquiry into his activities. Now... The striking similarities between Glenn and Oswald demand close scrutiny, okay? Because they are on very, very parallel tracks as to what they're doing here. And the question is, who in the hell was running these people? Now, I don't know 
where Glenn was doing his fair play for Cuba committee stuff. I don't think it was New Orleans. Uh, I'm not sure where it was, to be honest with you. But it just seems, <coughs> excuse me, a, a little odd, you know, that all this stuff just pops up out of nowhere. And now we're going to get into a little bit about Thomas Beckham, okay? And we touched on we've touched on him in a couple of these podcasts, but I keep coming back to him because something, something really bothers me about the dude, and. I, <laughs> I just think that he's full of shit. I think he's lying very, very badly. And <clears throat> like I said, he didn't tell Garrison anything. Okay, but he opens up after Fred Christmas did to the HSCA. And what he tells them is very interesting. Um, you know, he, he claims, you know, that he was. I mean, he didn't really have a job, you know, in New Orleans there, per se. He was some kind of a, a disc jockey, but I don't know what radio station. I don't even think he was on a radio station. And he was also trying to be a country singer using the name Mark Evans, okay? And Fred Christman claimed that he was like his manager and you know that he was trying to get him gigs and uh, trying to get him, uh, you know, booked for, or trying to get an album recorded and and all this weird stuff that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And let me read you a little something about Fred Crispin. Okay, this is a press release from uh, Garrison's office. On October 31st, 1968. A grand jury subpoena was issued today in connection with the investigation into the assassination of President Kennedy for the appearance of an out of state witness, Mr. Fred Lee Chrisman from Tacoma, Washington. Mr. Chrisman has been engaged in undercover activity for a part of the industrial warfare complex for years. His cover is that of a quote unquote preacher and a person that quote unquote engaged in work to help gypsies whatever the hell that means okay our information indicates that since the early 60s he has made many trips to New Orleans and Dallas in connection with his undercover work for that part of the warfare industry engaged in this manufacture of what is termed in military language a hardware meaning those weapons sold to the U.S. government, which are uniquely large and expensive. Okay, so what they're basically saying is Chrisman worked for the military industrial complex. Uh, Mr. Chrisman is a former employee of the Boeing Aircraft Company. Now, they put quotes around former. Uh, I guess they don't think he really is a former. Okay. In a sense that one defendant in the case is a former employee of Lockheed Aircraft Company in Los Angeles. In intelligence terminology, this ordinarily means that the, the connection still exists, but that the former employee has moved on to an underground operation. More often than not, a bad record or evidence indicating that he has been fired is prepared by the parent company to increase the disassociation between the two, but actually they are still connected, only covertly. Mr. Christman is being called as a witness because our office has developed evidence indicating a relationship on his part to persons involved in the assassination of President Kennedy. Okay? So Jim Garrison had this guy nailed. For the information of the public, we want to reiterate that President Kennedy was murdered by elements of the industrial warfare complex, working in concert with individuals in the United States government. At the time of his murder, President Kennedy was working to end the Cold War. By that time, however, the Cold War had become America's biggest business. The annual income of the defense industry was well over $20 billion a year. Okay, and that was 50 years ago, people. And there were forces in the industry and in the U.S. government which opposed to the ending of the Cold War. Now, it's exactly what they tell you about. 
and the reasons they give, you know, for people wanting Kennedy dead. Now, also, check this out. Uh, after Clay Shaw was charged, uh, and he was the first one to be charged, has appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court to halt prosecution on the grounds that Garrison violated his civil rights. He is appealing a decision of the Louisiana Supreme Court which found the New Orleans District Attorney was within his rights in acting as he did. The second man charged with conspiracy in the murder is Edgar Eugene Bradley of Los Angeles. Now this guy, Edgar Eugene Bradley, uh, changed his name to uh, Eugene uh, Braden. Jim Braden, James U Jim, Jim Braden, it's the same person is what I'm trying to say here. <laughs> uh, apparently never will stand trial due to the action last week by California Governor Ronald Reagan. Governor Reagan will not allow okay, Jim Braden to be extradited from California to face a Louisiana indictment. Bradley is employed by Dr. Carl McIntyre who conducts conservative radio programs across the nation. Uh, District Attorney Garrison has contended that President Kennedy's assassination Did I say President Garrison? I don't know. I don't mean President Garrison. I mean District Attorney Garrison has contended that President Kennedy's assassination was a result of a New Orleans based conspiracy. Okay. Interesting. Now I told you all about this before, okay? Um, and it concerns Fred Christman again, but I'll, let me reiterate it here, okay? Uh, Fred Lee Christman of Tacoma, Washington. He flies to New Orleans steadily. In 1964, 11 times. In 1965, 17 times. 1966, 32 times. 1967, 24 times. He is the first man that Clay Shaw called after being told that he was in trouble. And he is the first man that Beckham called also. He was questioned by both the CIA and FBI in 1966, but he was, but he is able to call uh, Washington and they laid off of him in a hurry. He is a very good friend with the Cubans uh, especially Sergio Araca in Dallas and George Jorge, or Jorge looks like Rodriguez in New Orleans. Uh, then it goes on to say, Mr. Christmas is a very odd man. Uh, let's see here. Here, here we go. Ask him to take a lie detector test and then ask him where he put the $200,000 delivered to him by, and now the name is redacted, of course, uh, delivered to him by, wait, wait a minute, Beckham. So Beckham delivered $200,000 to him in August of 67, Cuban money in, in parentheses. Money that is used to recruit killers to be sent to Cuba to try, to try for Castro. Ask him if it is not true that he has sent five different men to Sergio Araca in Dallas for final briefing before going on to attempt uh, to assassinate Castro. Make Crispin talk and you will have the answer as to why there has been fighting among certain Cuban factions over the money in certain buried places. You know this is true. Uh... Because some special Cubans have dropped out of sight. And then it says dropped in Torpedo Junction. Uh, Chrisman is also a pilot. He is the man that through Beckham and Sergio Araca paid off certain people. Is it not odd that he is a friend of Clay's as well as Beckham? Is it not strange that he knew Tippett? Just ask Chrisman certain questions under a lie detector. And see what his answers are. Wow. He is the one that told Mark Evans to hide out in Iowa, okay, and not to go make any statement about money or anything to Garrison. 
All right, and this is from a witness. I don't. It doesn't say who. Um, maybe D. White, possibly. Weird. I don't know. It's crazy. That, but uh, so if if we if we if we take a look at this a little bit better, um, what it what it appears to be. If we go by what Beckham, of course, told the HSCA that, of course, Crispin was his handler, and we we know what Beckham is asserted to have done, uh, delivering that package that was uh, put together in G. Ray Gill's office, um, that he delivered to Lawrence Howard in Dallas. You know, the the picture starts to get a little clearer, and when you look at Beckham. Okay, Beckham was in a lot of trouble. Um, let me see if I can find this real quick. Beckham was in a lot of trouble. Okay, here we go. This is what a couple of newspaper articles from the time uh, stated about Beckham. The headline says, Evangelist is afraid of Garrison's hook. And this is from December of 67. And it has a little picture of, of Lauren Hall and Lawrence Howard up in the corner. And a picture of Beckham sitting at this uh, big desk with these fake degrees in, on the back. Uh, an evangelist who moonlights with country and western songs outside the pulpit believes that by moving to Iowa... He may have avoided a summons to testify in New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison's investigation of an alleged conspiracy to assassinate the president. Uh, Thomas Edward Beckham, who uses the name Mark Evans as an entertainer, said he knew nothing about the assassination. Mr. Garrison subpoenaed Mr. Beckham and two other men as material witnesses, uh, saying they were in a unique position to observe activities relevant to the assassination. Mr. Beckham, who says he is a bishop, a bishop, a bishop in the Universal Life Church said in an interview in his former residence that he moved to Iowa recently. Uh, and the subheadline is Entertainer Views Iowa as a Shield. <laughs> okay, but, it, but he says he has nothing to hide. So why, why do you need to move to Iowa to try to get away from Garrison? I don't know. Um, but he was definitely linked with the Cubans, uh, the anti-Castro Cubans. He was the money man for them. Uh, you know, he designed, the, he, de, he set up the cans and, uh, wait a minute, here, let's get on to this. Clerk of the court records in Gretna, Louisiana, show Thomas Beckham and his brother Orville Beckham uh, were arrested for systematic theft of $12,000 in cash and merchandise from the Halpern's Fabric Store. Orville Beckham was the manager of the store at the time, and Thomas Beckham was employed in Halpern's Lakeside Store. Merchants, merchandise was taken allegedly to be used by both the brothers to stock two stores they intended to open in Gretna. Orville Beckham served a year of probation for this theft, but Thomas never was brought to trial. The last court entry on the case was January 30, 63, when the trial of Thomas Beckham was continued because he was a patient at the Mandeville State Hospital. Okay. Which means he was in the loony bin. Okay, while well, they were trying to, uh, to uh, figure this stuff out here. Um, <laughs> unbelievable. Moving on, I mean, he was like the Teflon Don. Nothing stuck to this guy. I mean, they were uh, just trying to hit him with all these little petty stuff, but he never got in trouble for it. Um, a New Orleans private detective complained Sunday that he's being used by Omaha evangelist Thomas Beckham. I've helped him out of jams before, and he apparently thinks I'll do it again, said Jack S. Martin. Okay. 
<laughs> you, yeah, I can't make this stuff up, people. Jack Martin, whom Mr. Beckham has described as a hatchet man for Jim Garrison. Okay. Interviewed by Telephone Sunday, Mr. Martin said that he has known Thomas Beckham for 10 to 15 years and has advised him on a number of legal matters. Mr. Beckham claimed he had never met Lee Harvey Oswald, named by the Warren Commission as the assassin of the president. But Mr. Martin, but Mr. Martin said that he has seen pictures of Mr. Beckham in the company of Oswald while handing out anti-Castro leaflets in New Orleans as part of Cuban exile militant movement. Mr. Martin says it was possible that he had introduced it was possible that he had introduced Beckham to David Ferry, the former airline pilot who died last February. He said he had met and talked to Mr. Ferry on several occasions while representing him on a criminal action filed by New Orleans police. He said Mr. Beckham may have been along on such a visit. Okay, now this is Jack Martin talking. So he acknowledges that uh, Thomas Beckham knew David Ferry. Although he has denied ever meeting Lee Oswald. Okay. Said Mr. Martin, I can't swear that Beckham ever knew Oswald, but I saw the pictures, and I know Garrison has copies of those now. He said the photos were taken by a New Orleans television station while producing a documentary program on the Cuban movement. Mr. Martin said he was never employed by the Garrison office, but had on occasion helped out. He said that so far as he knows, Mr. Beckham has never worked with the district attorney's office. Mr. Beckham's ordination as a priest Okay, first he was a bishop, now he's a priest in the old Orthodox Catholic Church of North America. Now this is the exact same one that David Ferry was a part of. Uh, <laughs> was obtained by mail order from a man in Toronto, Canada. <laughs> he, meaning Mr. Beckham, opened a mission on Rampart Street and came to me asking if I could get him some religious papers, Mr. Martin said. I told him about the guy in Toronto he described the mission as a haven for Cuban exiles uh, in the predominantly non-white section of New Orleans. At the time, he said Mr. Beckham wore black suits with a Roman collar. Even though he admitted to being acquainted with many of the persons investi uh, linked with the Garrison investigation, Mr. Martin described his role as insignificant. Okay. Now, is this the same Jack Martin that worked for Guy Bannister? Um... I don't know, but uh, it's pretty damn ironic, right? Uh, that, that this guy puts them all together here. Uh, it's wild. Okay, check this out. Beckham was acquitted of federal fraud by wire charges in Mobile, Alabama, July 28th. He was accused of fraudulently promoting a country music benefit concert, which was never held using the name of Eagleston Zimmerman. During the trial, he testified he worked for the CIA and played for the jury a country music record which he said he had recorded. <laughs> okay. After the acquittal, he remained in custody, pending transfer to Arkansas, where he faces more fraud charges. On the 29th, he was waiting for extradition. The House investigators came to Mobile for the interview. Stein said Beckham told the men he knew Lee Harvey Oswald in New Orleans that Kennedy was a victim of a conspiracy and he knows who took part in the conspiracy. But Stein said Beckham named no names when he was present. The attorney mentioned that Beckham has a 300 page manuscript about the assassination as he hasn't been able to get it published. FBI records show that Beckham now in custody in Pine Bluff, Arkansas is accused in the state of representing himself as a psych a physician and practicing in a, as a neuropathic physician in the Pine Bluff area. Uh, uh, Arkansas authorities also say Beckham formed his own chapter of or his own chamber of commerce in Whitehall near Pine Bluff and set up raffle ticket sales. They also say he has married couples claiming to be an ordained bishop of a religious group called Essence Gospel of Peace. Okay. Yeah, well, it gets better. Mr. Beckham, 27, evangelist and country western singer, pleaded no contest to a charge that he operated an unlicensed private correspondence school called the American Academy of Professional Arts. Earlier Wednesday, 
Mr. Beckham forfeited a $1,000 bond when he failed to appear to answer the charge. Judge Cropper issued a bench warrant. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's see. A man complained to Nebraska authorities that Mr. Beckham sold a degree to a California man who was illiterate. The man in turn began selling degrees. Mr. Gallup says some of the degrees claimed that the recipient was a doctor of metaphysics, able to perform drugless therapy. Uh, Mr. Beckham testified the degrees were of a type which required no prior education. He said they were similar to honorary degrees. After Mr. Beckham talked for a few minutes, Mr. Abode told him to shut up. Judge Cropper then called Mr. Beckham a phony. This is from September 68. <laughs> Unbelievable. So... This Beckham guy, okay? He is right in the middle of the shit. And it, it says right from his own mouth, okay? That he was part of all this mess going on in New Orleans. Okay? And I, I, I gotta believe that Fred Christman, with his background, was more than just a country western singer manager. Being that he traveled to New Orleans uh, about a hundred times in a period of four or five years and that's not even an exaggeration okay <laughs> not to mention of course that, that, that Shaw and Beckham both knew uh, Fred Christman and nobody talked until after Christman was dead and you hear you heard it from Beckham's own mouth okay that and other people who said they saw Beckham with Oswald on the street handing out flyers. Okay, and you can go back and and this apparently is the guy who we thought could have been Bill Shelley, but turns out probably was Thomas Beckham. Okay. And now you gotta put all the pieces of the puzzle together. Okay. Who knew who? Who was doing what for what reason? Who had the connections? Who was laying the plans? Did Oswald know what the hell was going on? Uh, you know, was 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 Beckham being set up as a, a second possible patsy, or was he mainly the money man for these Cuban organizations? Uh, you know, was he you know supplying false documents for people? He apparently was a very shady person. Um, you know, he got caught for some of the some some outrageously petty things. I can only imagine what he did not get caught for. Um, and he left the state to avoid being called in for Garrison's investigation, uh, which he didn't have to, have to go to, but eventually uh, decided to, but just never told him anything. And it's really interesting that Jim Brayton's name pops up as, as, as Ronald Reagan prevented him from having to go uh, and be subpoenaed by Jim Garrison. And have, so he wouldn't have to go to New Orleans and testify or be charged with anything. It's very interesting. Uh, like I said, with all these connections, you know, sometimes the mind just gets boggled. And, but it, it, Oswald was just a lone nut, right? <laughs> you know, that's what these lone nutters will have you believe. You know, he was just a lone nut. But they ignore all this other stuff, okay? It's an awful big goddamn coincidence, you know, that, that, that all these people happen to know each other. You know, it's very naive to conceive that it was all just a giant coincidence of events leading up to November 22nd, 1963. You know, but Oswald was just a lone nut, right? You know, he's this crazy, uh, crazy wife-beating communist guy, right? Sure he was. You know, but I'm not saying Oswald was totally innocent in all this. You know, he probably, he probably knew about the plans. In a 
general sense of the word um, doubtful he knew the specifics or exactly how he was being uh, moved and positioned and, and cared for and set up pretty much you know we, we, we can connect the movers and shakers we can connect the interpen guys and with the anti chemistry Cubans and the uh, and General Walker and these fierce anti communists like Guy Bannister we can tie them in with David Ferry we can tie them in to Thomas Beckham okay we can tie them in with Carlos Marcelo we can tie them into all knowing each other okay and poor Lee Oswald is right here in the middle of all this stuff and to, to ignore it is just oh it's a big giant coincidence you know I somehow fail to believe that and an interesting note of course is the William Riley Coffee Company who was run by uh, well Riley Coffee Company run by William, William Riley who was a massive anti-communist he had a lot of money and he loved to invest you know his money in in these causes and it was right around the corner from Bannister's office okay so I'm sure if, if, if Lee come in there needing help or needing a job he was sent there you know maybe promised great things down the road um, Maybe they needed him to terminate his employment because they needed him to do other things. But really interesting is the in a, well in a subsequent interview, not his testimony, because he didn't say anything to the, to the Warren Commission about this per se. But Adrian Alba, who ran the garage uh, beside Riley Coffee Company for the government vehicles like the FBI, CIA, Secret Service, it was the government garage. Uh, he noted that an FBI man came into town and he was given this green Studebaker out of the, uh, the carpool and the next day he observed Lee Oswald go out to the street and talk to the occupant of this Studebaker uh, for a couple minutes and received a, a big white envelope which he stuffed up under his shirt and walked away and a couple of days later uh, the same thing he goes out and talks to this guy for a while he's handed in an envelope and then Alba says you know the guy goes back to Washington but he, he was sure that he was an FBI guy you know because he has to know this stuff for the for the paperwork aspect and who he's giving these cars to so very interesting um well let's 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 call it there for tonight and uh I will implore all of you to please visit the 22 November Network. Uh, give us a like on Facebook. Give us a follow. You can follow the blog. You, you'll receive an email every time anything's posted there. Uh, you can follow the comments. You know, you can do all kinds of things at the 22 November Network uh, site. You know, we have me and Doug for assassination conversation. We have Gail Martin and the Grassy Old Girl for assassination observation. You know, their 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 blogs and articles and and columns, JFK related and research related. And of course, you can check out our brothers and sisters in the network, Leonard Sanic and Popeye, and their respective shows. And feel free uh, to hit us up on the Facebook page or post up anything you want, evidence you want to talk about. And uh, let's get a conversation going, people. That's what we're here for. Um, that's what we want to do. And if you like what we're talking about, please share links. Okay? So all your friends know where to find us. That's the only way we're going to grow is with your help. And uh, we thank you for everything that we've received so far. And all your help so far. It's very much appreciated. Anyway, this one is in the can up to the satellite, beam directly to your ears. 
Rob Clark is out. <laughs>